So we've recognized the usefulness, perhaps, of these kinship diagrams, these kinship charts. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the differences between like a nuclear family and these descent groups. Um, kinship terminology was proposed uh, by Lewis Henry Morgan in 1871. And there were six basic kinship terminology patterns that he ranked on an evolutionary scale. Um, they're not necessarily, uh, like there's no better or worse way of naming families. Um, so I would be, I would hesitate to say that they um, are evolutionarily significant, um, but we'll look at these all the same. Um, Krover in 1909 continued this research arguing that kinship terminologies are shaped by clan organization, not by a group's position on an evolutionary scale. So this started off from a very uh, kind of colonial mindset. Um, as much of anthropology did. And so um, th this is why I would hesitate to say that there's any kind of evolutionary relationship. There's no like primitive kinship terminology and advanced kinship terminology, um, just as there's not really primitive languages or primitive cultures and advanced cultures, right? We, we tend to rate them from this very Eurocentric view, given the history of anthropology and the role that, well, I mean, it's, it's, not just history of anthropology, really, um, but this this idea of whitewashing and, and somehow ranking things that are more Eurocentrically organized as somehow superior. So we'll talk about Kroeber's categories. Uh, what Kroeber distinguished between were the differences between persons of the same and of separate generations, the difference between lineal and collateral relationships. So what does that mean? Well, lineal is, okay, so the same in separate generations is this ego versus father versus grandfather with versus great grandfather. This difference between lineal and collateral relationships is like the difference between ego and a son versus ego and his brother. Uh, differences of age within one generation um, is present in some of uh, the kinship terminology that we see cross-culturally. The sex of the relative, the sex of the speaker or ego uh, the sex of the person through whom the relationship exists, the distinction of blood relatives from what we call affinial relationships or connections by marriage, so your brother versus your brother-in-law, and then the condition of life of the person through whom the relationship exists. So what does this look like then when we look at these actual different kind of methodologies of defining kin. Well, we're going to talk about six, the Eskimo, the Hawaiian, Omaha, Crow, Iroquois, and Sudanese kinship systems, and talk about each of these in turn. So we'll start with the Eskimo kinship uh, system. Ego, of course, because of our male-centric uh, patriarchal societal structure is male. Ego has siblings. Those siblings may be either male or female. Um, ego has a mother and father. On the father's side, we've got aunts and uncles. On the mother's side, we've got aunts and uncles. The offspring of aunts and uncles, regardless of whether they're maternal or paternal, are the cousins. This is what we're most familiar with, right? We don't have different terminology for male versus female siblings. We equally weight our relationships. Uh, on our father's side with our mother's side. We have the same terminology for maternal, um, for our mother's siblings as we do for our father's siblings, same terminology for the offspring of our father's siblings as we do for the offspring of our mother's siblings. Uh, with the Hawaiian kinship system, again, we've got ego. Again, we've got our siblings. Again, we have mother and father. But look here, father and father's brother are both termed father, okay? Mother and mother's sister are both termed sister. Mother's brother is termed father, mother's, or father's sister is termed mother. So the distinction, instead of being um, father and mother in that lineal relationship, and then collateral terms for aunts and uncles, now we just take a whole generational approach so that everybody in the parental generation is called father and mother. Everybody in ego's generation is called siblings, 
the Omaha kinship system um, is similar with respect. Okay, now I have to start over. I don't, I'll just have to edit it out, but I need you to go back out there. No, I'm not done. This is recording right now. So, oh. <clears throat> the Omaha kinship system is similar with respect to father's brother also being father and mother's sister also being mother. But what we notice here is that mother's brother and father's sister have separate terms. So what this means is that only father's brother's children and mother's sister's children are going to be considered in the sibling set. Okay, Mother's brother's children are called mother's brother and mother. And then father's sister's children are called nephew and niece. According to the Crow kinship system, uh, we've got father and mother. Um, again, with father's brother being father, father's brother's children being siblings, mother's sister being mother, mother's sister's children being siblings. So this part here is similar to the Omaha kinship system. But here we've got mother's brother having son and daughter, whereas father's sister has father and father's sister. Okay, so when we get into um, the opposite sex siblings of your father and of your mother, we've got different terminology. With the Iroquois kinship system, uh, ego's only siblings are those that come from the same mother and father. This is, this Iroquois system is very akin to some distinctions that were carried back really or, or prevalent in colonial Europe. And that is the distinction between parallel cousins and cross cousins. Parallel cousins are those born of your parents' same sex sibling. So father's brother's children and mother's sister's children are considered parallel cousins. The children born to your parents' opposite sex sibling, so father's sister's children and mother's brother's children are considered cross cousins. And this was really important in like monarchical um, Europe because parallel cousins were considered taboo um, or considered incestuous relationships which we can see reflected here through the same terminology that your paternal uncle is also called father. Your maternal aunt is also called mother. So therefore, these parallel cousins would be considered incestuous, whereas the cross cousins were valid marriage partners. And so I'm sure that you've seen some of the memes that circulate around or the articles uh, on like history.com and such um, that show the degree of um, intermarrying among European nobility and a lot of the uh, genetically recessive conditions that offspring were born with. So like the Habsburg nose and chin, the hemophilia and colorblindness of like the czar's children in Russia, etc. These are due to marriage between close relatives. Um, also, just even the notion of blue bloods um, that comes from a genetically recessive disorder that makes the blood actually seem more of a bluish hue. Um, and that has to do with this preference then for the marriages of cross cousins. So that Ego would marry his mother's brother's daughter. Um, that, that was a way of keeping nobility, quote unquote, within the family line, right? Of keeping noble blood separate from uh, more common individuals. And then lastly, the Sudanese kinship system. And I still can't get my cursor to catch up with me here. The Sudanese kinship system uh, has, again, father and mother with their same sex siblings also being father and mother, it recognizes that cousins are considered siblings, but defines 
the cousins differently. So father's sisters type one, father's brothers type two, mother's sisters type three, and mother's brothers type four. All right, so kinship terminologies help people keep track of many relatives by assigning these categorical terms but it's still impossible for everyone to keep track of everybody. And so we talk about this idea of genealogical amnesia, um, that there's no way to simply keep track of the relatedness of every possible um, familial distinction or kinship distinction. So in that context, we tend to um, kind of condense terms. We tend to cast a wide umbrella, so to speak, over relatives within um, just a certain generation. All right, so one of the roles of families then is this role played in cooperative child rearing. And so between the 1930s and the 1950s, Margaret Mead studied how families raised children in several different cultures. She was part of a movement within cultural anthropology called the culture and personality movement, which assumed that how children's early rearing experiences uh, shape his or her approach to the world, not only in childhood, but in adulthood as well. And so some of the specific distinctions that Margaret Mead was making was between parent reared and sibling reared or between parent reared and child reared children. Um, and particularly um, in these tribes that she came into contact with in uh, like the Pacific region. So we're talking about Oceania, Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, etc. Uh, that there were some really important distinctions or really important differences in the way that children were reared. And so coming out of <clears throat> this kind of Western idea of child rearing, right? It was mothers who raised their children. Um, in many of these Pacific Islander cultures, it was older siblings who raised their younger siblings. And so this is what we talk about, sibling raised versus parent raised. Uh, there also is a, a very robust pattern of um, adoption by ants uh, among the cultures of the Pacific. And so um, particularly when you've got a wide age range between sisters, such that there are um, pre-reproductive sisters um, and, and sisters who are like in the height of their reproduction, or there are younger sisters that are having families after another sister has already reared her children to adulthood, you would see a sister adopt kind of quote unquote excess children. So that if I as a reproductive age individual had six children to take care of, and I had a sister who was in her 60s and had already done the bulk of her child rearing, she might adopt one or more of my children to help lessen the load, so to speak. Or, you know, me at my uh, 40s age, if I had a sister who was only 17 or 18, she might adopt one or two of my children to help lower the burden. All right, so Samoan approaches to child rearing involved children participating in work very early on in their lives. Um, this is something that we maybe don't quite understand or um, are opposed to. Um, in most cultures that were pre-state societies and, and particularly pre-modern societies, there was child labor, right? Um, yes, children learn through play, but Part of what children play at is adult social roles. And so children across cultures play house, for example. They play marriage. They play um, I'm the mommy, you're the baby kind of thing. Um, and, and they play at jobs when they're really young. Um, children are able to make important contributions, though, to household production by the time they're preteens and teens. Um, and so whereas we keep our children separate, not having meaningful work really until they're uh, mid to late teens. We don't really allow children to work for pay prior to about the age of 15. And even at 15, they have to have a, a worker's permit that their school has to sign off on. And their fundamental job is education, is being a student. And that's different in a lot of other cultures. So in Samoa, children would start working very, very young. They would gather 
veggies and fruits that were that they were able to reach. They would help tend the garden. Children are great at weeding. Once they're able to identify what the weeds are, it's kind of easier than parents doing it because children are lower to the ground. So horticultural tribes of which these specific island groups were, uh, there's a lot of, of functional productive work that children can do. The other aspect of Samoan culture was that child's age doesn't dictate maturity or, or like age classifications. Rather, it was outward physical changes, such as those associated with puberty. And so from the moment that girls went through puberty, they were expected then to be almost maternal in nature. So whether that occurred at 17 or 12 um, didn't really matter. It wasn't age sets per se, it was outward measures of maturity um, sets. So that uh, children who developed early, pubertally early, um, would be marriageable and would be having children at significantly earlier ages. Neat's cross-cultural research also included time spent on Manus Island, New Guinea and Bali, um, and visual work on child rearing in India, France, Japan, and rural Canada. So a, a good broad <clears throat> cross-cultural comparison. Now, when we take this viewpoint, I, I, I know I keep coming back to this aspect of adaptive strategy and predicting cultural similarities, but that's because it's so robust. <clears throat> when we take a step back and look at cultural similarities due to adaptive strategies, we find that foragers are rather indulgent of their children. And so when we watched Nice Story of a Kung Woman, you saw that uh, that young children at least were playing, right? And liked to follow their mothers. There wasn't really work being done by let's say eight, nine, 10 year old children. Once they hit puberty, once they were in their teens, it was very, very different. Horticultural groups, by contrast, children are doing a lot of work in the garden beside their mothers. Um, and that has to do with the fact that it, it takes less time to master some of the horticultural production skills. So yeah, children aren't going to clear the fields, slash and burn, um, and do all that heavy labor, but they are able to plant. They are able to weed um, to varying degrees. They're able to help water, um, depending on how heavy the vessel is that they're carrying water with, right? Um, pastoral populations, children would be involved with tending and milking cattle. Um, and then in agricultural populations, we see children certainly being used for farm labor. Um, in the early ages of industrialism, children served factory, they worked in factory jobs. That's because a lot of the machinery, when it would break down and they needed to be able to get in there and fix it, they needed small bodies and small hands to be able to get in there. Of course, this resulted in a lot of child deaths um, due to accident. But um, you know, children and women had a lot of factory positions early on. As we've moved to this post-industrial context that we live in now, we place such a premium on education. And it, it really, I mean, it pays off generally um, in that, you will earn more being a high school graduate than a high school dropout. You'll earn more being a college graduate than only a high school graduate, so on and so forth. So that more investment in education generally is associated with higher pay levels to a certain point. Um, but this has removed children and critically adolescents from serving or fulfilling uh, useful production, meaningful production roles. Rather, we expect our children to be in school for much of their first basically 20 years at least, if not longer. Um, this is also associated then with, you know, let's say the ennui uh, or teen angst, um, because teens who have historically had very adult kind of social roles now are in this limbo where they're not considered adult enough to make decisions or have agency over their own actions, but not really considered child enough to not face consequences for those actions. So just something to keep in the back of your mind that we can see a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of uh, important overlap between societies that practice that same method of producing their resources.
Uh, today, many anthropologists emphasize that parental investment of time and nurturing makes a difference in how much children aspire to achieve as adolescents and adults. Hunter-gatherers, though they're with their children a lot, or at least mothers are with their children a lot, it's not like reading stories, like the whole population will tell stories and such. Um, but uh, though there's proximity, there's not necessarily a lot of directed parenting. There's active parenting for sure. Um, but aside from oral traditions and such, right? Um, they're not sitting there reading to their children. Um, horticultural populations, the women are doing so much work that though there may be a lot of time that children spend in, con in proximity to their mothers, again, it's not this active kind of nurturing investment of time in children. Um, so these parenting styles carry over then, um, even in the modern class systems, right? It's highly educated families that um, have the money to um, to read to their children, to put their children in enrichment programs, to provide quote unquote quality educational opportunities to their children. Lower income classes can't do that. Um, we tend to uh, frown upon people who leave children alone um, in contexts where they could get in trouble, right? Um, really to a point of extremism. Um, the, 80s kids like I, well, I, mean, I was born in the 70s but grew up in the 80s I mean we were latch kid family key the kids right latch key kids is what we were called um you know we were often left to our own devices as young as six or seven years old you'd get off the school bus and um, you'd walk home you'd fix yourself a snack and plop yourself down in front of the tv until your parents got home after work and that wasn't frowned upon we were able to stay in the car while our parents ran errands. We were able to stay at the house while our parents ran errands really from quite young ages. Whereas now, you know, we've got these kind of artificial societal rules that kids can't stay home alone until they're 12. Um, and I mean, rightfully so in many contexts, but it's just a different kind of, um, kind of expectation that, um, children not be unsupervised without adults playing a role. And that changes the kinds of play that children are involved in, um, changes the worries of families, creates um, really economic hardship when you're trying to <clears throat> scramble for supervised care for your school-aged children um, when there's not low-cost kind of child care available. And so that changes the dynamics too of the kind of investment that parents are able to make in their children's early lives. All right, so for this thinking critically about kinship marriage and the family, Lewis Henry Morgan thought of American kinship as the most rational way of reckoning kin relationships. He referred to our system as a descriptive rather than classificatory system because relatives on a person's mother's side were called the same as those on the father's side. But in fact, these terms like aunt, uncle, and cousin group together very different kinds of relatives under the same label. So our system really is a classificatory system. Using your own family as an example, discuss how these terms are classificatory, even if mother, father, son, and daughter are not. So I, I specifically want you to think about, you know, there's this notion in New Mexico, which I love, um, of your aunties, right? Think critically here. Who specifically are your quote unquote aunties? We definitely have a preference towards maternal kin in America and really in, um, in New Mexico, right? In that your aunties are more often going to be your mother's sisters or even close friends of your mother's who fill in that sister role that's left from smaller family uh, sizes and such. So do, do you consider, or did you consider growing up your paternal kin and your maternal kin in quite the same kind of standing um, or context? Were you equally close to your cousins from your mother's sister as you were to your cousins from your father's brother? 
you know, reflect on some of these differences in, even though the terminology may not be very different, um, some of these differences in how um, kinship mediated your familial relationships, um, and particularly a distinction between maternal and paternal kin.